with and cautious of idol worship. Now I have to begin by uh, giving, uh, I was uh, shown that yes, buffalo, if shechted properly, can be kosher. Uh, generally though, there is no restaurant that you'll find that offers kosher buffalo meat. Uh, I, I was, I've never seen it before, but that yes, if it has split hooves and chews its cud, then yes, it would be kosher. If you could shecht it and find some, uh, then there would be the ability to have it as kosher. I mentioned that I wasn't sure about the question and that I didn't think that it was kosher, but I was shown to be wrong, so thank you very much. Uh, but practically, you, you basically won't find it. You won't go to the shuk, you won't go to Mea Sharm and find you know, some fresh f buffalo flasics. Uh, but if you could, then it could be that uh, you would have access to something. By the way, along those lines, giraffe is also kosher, as well as some other exotic uh, options, but we don't practically have them. Uh, generally, we have uh, cow. Uh, some will have like a type of deer, but cow. And that's basically the flashes, bokar, sheep as well. Rabbi, but would the like cutting off the horns of a deer that wouldn't be cruel to the animal to protect your the rabbi who does the shafting, right? So that he doesn't get bored. So like if you anesthetize an animal to remove the horns that when it's shafted later on, it's not a danger to the rabbi. So it's very, very important to know that a lot of there are prohibitions in the Torah of Tsar Balachayim, of not doing unnecessary harm to animals. We reject people that, you know, light cats' tails on fire. We, we, it's, ev it's cruel. There's no reason for it. Uh, kids that go and ki kick pigeons, usually there's something very wrong with them. Uh, those are always signs that there's probably, probably some mental disorder that's brewing. Uh, the kids that burn ants with magnifying glasses in the sun, I don't know if that's yet a disorder, but because that's usually like the first thing a kid discovers when they're like four or five years old, like, whoa, look what you can do. Starts with a leaf. And then the kids that stay with leaves, usually they're more, you know, they're just into the cool factor. When kids start doing it with ants, at that point, you, you know, the four year old, five year old should know, like, I don't know if I want to play with you anymore. Like, you're, you're going in the wrong direction. Four-year-olds don't really do stuff like, you know, like cats on fire. That's already like kids that are getting older and more. Then you really want to move away because the, that's real Isuri Deir Isa. They're transgressing the Torah. So any harm unnecessary to animals is very, very severe. All that being said, the Torah gave us the world to use for productive purposes. We were given the permission by God to eat meat. It has to, though, be done in the best way possible, the least painful way possible. Everything has to be done in the best way possible. That's why shechita is the least painful of all ways. If there are ways to make things less painful in any way possible, then we encourage it, and it has to be done. Yeah? Where do we stand on fish? Is there, I mean, it's probably a process, but what is that process? Fish, uh, they don't need shechita. Uh, but yeah, it, the, the better that you can do it, always the least painful, the better. The least painful, the better. It's very, very important. It shows the, the, the Torah's sensitivity for life. And that's all life. That's all life. Now, Tsar Balachayim is, is for animals, but even plant life. You can't just go and... It just shows how far the Torah takes us. You can't just go and, like, squish up a, you know, a, a tulip just for fun. Like, let me squish that up. Yeah, ho, ho, ho. Rip stuff off trees. I just, w what are you doing? There's prohibitions of wasting and of, and of just acting in a way about Tashchus of, like, why are you doing that? Why are, you, why are you ripping out God's world? If you have a purpose for it, then it's another story. When there's purpose then the Torah has permission, it, in long, as long as that purpose is not the, something that goes against the Torah. But it's something which is permitted, 
and you do it with purposeful behavior, it's permitted. This is very important. If we were to sum up this whole concept, everything that the Torah is telling us to do is to do things with purpose. Everything has purpose. So yes, could you have an animal and eat the animal with purpose? Yes. Purpose done in a healthy way, done in a permitted way. It's all permitted if it's with purpose. And as long as it doesn't transgress, a person can't say, I'm going to eat the notorious PIG. So, because I want, I'm doing it with purpose. There's a reason we don't like to say the name. Because power to the other side. So, you have the notorious. So, you, you can't say, I'm, I'm dealing with purpose. I want to eat it and learn Torah. I'm sorry, but that's prohibited, according to the Torah, for Klal Yisrael to eat the pea. You're not allowed to have it. The BLT sandwich is, is prohibited. I'm not going to tell you about it. Even though I'm doing it with purpose. No. You can't make up your own purpose if it violates the Torah. But where the Torah says that it's permitted, it has to be done in the most purposeful, conscious way possible. That's why you know, before we eat anything, we make blessings. Most people, when they grew up, most, not all, most, the general approach to eating was, this goes here, insert now, go. <laughs> it's, 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 it's very, very functional. And, and just get the job done, right? We say, wait a second, God gave this to me. I am appreciative of this. Is it kosher to begin with? I, I, I have intention behind what I'm doing. So we stop. That's why we make blessings before we eat. Very, very important. Everything has purpose. So if something has a purpose, for example, the deer has something on the antler, which is a very powerful medicine called deer antler. You're allowed to harvest that part of the antler. You can harvest it, and you can eat it. And it's very powerful medicine. Everything is done with purpose, with purpose. Everything with purpose, okay? But stam, just to cut off animals, uh, just because I want to put that on my wall, yeah. Why? Just because it looks like I'm the man. I stuffed that lion. I'm, you know, yeah, I'm the man. Look at me. I just killed the lion and stuffed it. Well, it might be different if you need the skin for clothing, if you need the hide, if, you need, if, if there's a purpose behind it, you need to shelter your family. You need to, you know, fill in the blank. There's a purpose. You need to pick the, you need to pick the flowers to put on your Shabbos table that you beautify your Shabbos table. Well, that's... That's a different thing. Everything has a purpose. But just, I'm just going to pick stuff, like throw it on the ground. Who said we're not? We're not. It has to do with purpose. Everything with purpose. Also, it helps us live a conscious life. Everything is conscious that we do. Okay, that was a big introduction to make, have a sip of this coffee. Amen. Okay, we are speaking about how idol worship started. And I just, I want to go into that more deeply, okay? We mentioned yesterday that where the error was, was that people said, well, if God honors, shalom, shalom, if God honors his ministers, well, why can't I also honor the ministers? And then it started to go south. That's called shittif. They all knew that God created the ministers. They all know that the power lies with the president, but why can't I honor the cabinet? So we're now in the Rambam Halacha Beis. Now it's about to get a little bit uh, sticky here. Okay, you guys ready? Halacha Beis. And then many, many days, weeks, months, and years went by after they started worshipping the stars. But of course, worshipping only because, well, God honors His ministering angels, he, he gave them power. So as an honor to God, we're going to honor the angels. As an honor to the president, we're going to honor his, you know, the secretary of state. And that will be by extension. Of course, God is the, the one. But as time went on, look what happened. These are, these are eternal words of the Rambam. Amdu bebnei Adam. Neviye Sheker. False prophets began to rise up in the world as the days and weeks, months, and years went on. 
false prophets. Now, what did the false prophets start to say? The Amru Shehakel, that God siva lahem. The Amr lahem ivdu koychav ploini. That the false prophets came to us and said, Oh, you should serve this star. Not just, it, well, it's, isn't it fitting that we should? No, now they came and the false prophet said, You should. That God came to me. Now notice, this is not a national revelation. Is a single person saying, God came to me. God, and if he was very, uh, if he was very charismatic, you might go with it, right? I mean, what, what a, well, he's, he's making a good point. Wow. God came to you? Unbelievable. And he's, very, and he's, God, he's, he's a quick talker. and you know, he, he has a way of doing it. And they started to listen. Wow. God told me that you guys should worship this star. Now, by the way, just make sure to pay $99.99 you know, $99, in my Venmo account. And then, you know, I'll make sure you guys are doing it right, obviously. Or you should worship all the stars. And, oh, and you should offer these stars, these angels, you should offer them libations, you should give them incense, you should give them, you know, you should bow down to them, bring sacrifices in their name, and sadly, what came of this was uh, you should offer your children to them. This sick stuff. And there were many, many such things and such practices that started to take over. And what happened after that? The Bonoloi Hecha, and they would make uh, these constellations or these, these angelic energies, they would make them sanctuaries. And then they also made, interesting, they made graven images. Symbols of the, of the stars, symbols of these angelic forces, these ministers. They made, they made statues, symbols, tsuras. You know, it's easy, it's good, it's something to carry around your pocket as a reminder, things to put around your neck. They, they started to make graven images that would represent, and if you would bow down to that image, that will, that's like you're bowing down, it's like a pledging of an allegiance to the bigger thing. At this point, though, God is still here. Just, we heard that God wants us to do this. So there's a false prophetic narrative, talk about fake news, coming and now taking over. Yes? Where does this stand on like Logan defeating like at times and other really popular for necklaces and things like that? But they Are you allowed to wear Mogan David? That's the question. So Mogan David is not a symbol of any idol. Mogan David is a symbol, it's really a symbol of the Merkava, it's a symbol of of male, female, but not a symbol of an idol. Here, these were symbols that you would bow down. We don't bow down to any Mugan Dovids. You'll also notice the Jew has almost zero symbols. We're very, we stay away. If you look at our shuls and our, there's no symbols. You'll notice in certain shuls, you'll see like a picture of the Kotel, or you'll see a picture of like uh, Reb Shimon, you know, depends what shul you're in. You'll see a picture like of uh, Uman or something, uh, or, or, or Kever uh, the But there's no symbols. We don't have symbols everywhere or deities. It's completely absent of that. You know, this image here is, they're, they're Hebrew letters. Hebrew letters not symbols. The letters themselves are names of God. Everything is about God. Everything is about God. Okay, so look, what, look what's going to happen here. What I'm saying is we don't have names of, uh, of the intermediaries around. That's not so much our thing, if you notice that. 
We know there's intermediaries. God set it up that way. But it's not like all around Shul you see you know, names of all the angels or names of all the stars and the galgalim. Everything is, 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 is God. It's all about one. It's all about... Yeah, everything is godly. It's all about God. But Hashem Echad. Maybe you'll see the Ten Commandments and that's all about God. The first of which is God is one. The second of which is That's right. Oh, the way Rabbi Berger says it, the first commandment is I am God. And the second commandment is and it's not you. <laughs> don't, think that it, don't think that that's you. It's God. The one. The only one. Okay, we're going to get a little bit more to that when we get into the third constant mitzvah. We're still building up the entire backstory of idol worship. Why, why it's just so important to see the historical unfolding. So now the false prophets built the sanctuaries and they made suras, kedei l'shtach in order that people should bow down because it's very convenient when you could show somebody something, you can give them a, an image of something and say, oh, come to the temple and bow down to this. It's harder when it's conceptual. You're right, the gods, lowercase g, of the rains and the sun, that's a harder, but if I could bring a symbol to that and say, let's gather together, we're gonna to bow down to this. Obviously we mean the bigger thing, but symbols and suras and idols started to fill the world. As we say in Yiddish, getchkalas. Getchkalas went, became everywhere at, during this time. So getchkalas are spreading in order that there should be hishtach avaya. Hishtach avaya means to prostrate and bow down. What's the idea of a bow? Why do we bow? What does that mean to bow? Supplication. So there's that. But, you know, I, could, I, could, I could supplicate by just saying, you know, please, help me out. Like, what's the physical significance? Lowering yourself, so there's lowering yourself. And so, so for that, I could just do this. The full hishtach avaya is nullification to that. A nullification, meaning not only am I asking you, I'm acknowledging that you have a power and I need that power, but I also have power. A bow is a complete nullification to that. I have nothing without you. You know where a Jew bows? And you know we do full bow, full out? And that's right, when we hear God's name in the Beis HaMikdash. We also bow. And also on Yom Kippur, but it's the only time we get that fully on the floor bow. That's right. And what Shana we do also. Is that a Jew does say, yes, God, all we have is you. There, there is that level of absolute truth. Is all we have is you. But we go right to the source. None of the intermediaries, okay? So we're, we're in the intermediaries. And the, the false prophets made it this way. L'kolam, everyone. Noshim, Ketanim, women, children, Vishar am arts. The false prophets told them images that they saw in their hearts. Maybe through some vision that they had. Some false prophetic vision. And they conjured up. And it could have even been astrological things that they saw. That they then conjured up that image and then gave that image over. And this is the one. Now it gets better. This is the image of that intermediary that was told over to me in my prophecy. This is the image. Okay, now look where it goes from here. After that started to spread, at that point it exploded. They started making sanctuaries everywhere. And underneath beautiful shady trees, all of a sudden you would go and you would see altars under trees. You would see anywhere where humanity spread forth. You started to see graven images that a person should be on, on a hilltop and don't worry, we've got you covered, come under the tree. And you would encounter, and you would see an image. You would see, oh, so you're, you're out there. You're, you're going to need some help. You're going to need some guidance along the way, how to get down the mountain, how to avoid the, 
the, the boogeyman and, and the, the lions and the tigers and the bears, oh my. Well, good thing that there's you know, a little image up here under the tree so you can have a little service and then continue on your way. Underneath the trees, uberashe aharm on tops of the mountains, valag voice in, in the mountain valleys. Umiskabtsim, mishtachavim lahem, and people started, this, this gained force, and humanity started getting together and having, you know, ceremonies and having festivals, idol worshiping, you know, mega conventions. conventions, mega conventions. And everyone's bowing down. You, could, you, could, you know, you could, I could see, you know, in the modern day, I could see the false prophet, like, with his, you know, ear thing in his, Are you ready? <laughs> mega, you know, megaphones, and just everyone, and then they you know, drop the image, and everyone bows down. Now, a good thing that the false prophet was there, because what would he tell them? Shazehat Sura, that you should know, this image, Meitiva Umeiria, by serving this, he can either give you good or not, or bad. So be careful. Serve him properly. You should be careful to serve him and to be afraid of him because your destiny lies with him. And there was a momentum. Everyone's doing it. And you should know, they had priests among them, amongst them, that would say, oh, if you do it like this, it's going to be good. If you do it like this, if you, if you worship like this, you're going to get this. If you worship like that, oh, you're going to pull these strings. You're going to get these things. And, you know, good thing you're paying us a lot of money because we'll tell you how to do it. Don't worry, you'll make much more by giving us the money. It's like a business proposition. But because we have to tell you how to serve it, what not to do, be careful. There were certain idols that you had to defecate in front of them. That's right. And the Gemara discusses that, you know, they, they spoke of one time somebody came, I'm, excuse me for even saying, and he performed such a service in front of that Baal, like nobody ever performed such a service of, of human excrement ever before. And all of the idol worshippers were, were in awe of, of, wow, such form, such, such unbelievable devotion. Uh, it was a big mess, obviously. And, and you, you see, though, how humanity could fall for something. Yes? Were these like, did they have like tangible results? Because like, I doubt yes. they were stupid. Yes, they do have tangible results. Because remember, God set things up that there are emissaries. Without getting also into the black magic element, God set things up where, yes, you can go to the idols and you can get things that you want. We're going to see, we're not just talking about the sticks and the stones, we're talking about corresponding and speaking to the angelic energies as well, and going to the intermediaries. So kind of like cause and effect stuff. Yes, cause and effect, pulling strings, doing this. And they saw that there was effect. They would go to the, do the rain dance and the sun god, and put on the, the, you know, the eagle headdress, and they would shake the feathers, and they would make, they would conjure up certain energies in order to bring down certain things. There's only one thing. God said, come to me. Where do you think they all get their blessing from? Come to me. That's right. So all the shrines and all the... There's only one source. Come to me. But it's very alluring. It was very easy. It's very easy. You just had to kind of put the, you know, quarter in the machine and press the button and, you know, the prize would come out. Going to God is much deeper, is much more real. Okay, we're going to continue with this part three tomorrow, my dear friends. Have a wonderful day. We should be zoning the shit. Amen. Amen. Call to safe flight. Safe flight.